Come on, this computer. Okay, hi everyone. This is the I'm a Fellows meeting, and we are going to be talking all about humanistic management. And Michael, take us away. <laughs> okay, well, good morning, everyone. And it's great that I can share some of the accumulated wisdom um, over time. And I think one of the reasons why we're, we're talking about this is that you, some of you are working on a categorization for humanistic management, right? And so what I wanted to do is there is a paper out in, in my book. I've attempted to do an archetypal, uh, uh, yeah, uh, categorization to help. And I think it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that and also just see what's, what's lacking, what's missing which, with other categories. And maybe there are papers that could be generated and or other things uh, out of that. So uh, that's the intention with which I share. I have a presentation that I can also get activated. One moment here. Um, now I need to practice my Zoom skills. Share. Share. Here. So you see, oh, you see, you see something. Can you see? Yes. Yep. That's great. Okay. So, I mean, I don't need to really spend much time in the beginning, but the framing, that's where I think it comes from. And that's why I think it's important to see that this is the, the dimensions um, that I, I think are relevant for categorization. So we have manifold challenges, of course, and uh, this is not new. Uh, this is the golden calf story. This is the modern version of it, shareholder value maximization. I don't know if you know this cartoon. I think it's a very famous one. It says, if you can read it, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Uh, and uh, I think that's sort of a, just a, <clears throat> general cynicism that's the, it's been creeping up about how we run the world how we organize the world and it's also reflected in common culture uh yeah, our organizations fit for humans is society fit for humans i think that's sort of really the, the bigger question and we're looking for heroes many many times heroes we have looked for them in the past saints uh and uh, we find them, and I do think that in some way, what we're what we're looking for is a is a way to go beyond heroes, and I think humanistic management can be that. And it's again, it's it's at the mindset level that I think this is operating uh, mostly. And I think I've shared with you this. Uh, Anke was um, I, I checked with uh, <laughs> with Kate uh, afterwards also. Um, so the, the idea of the mindset as the responsibility for maximization, that's the, that's the ultimate goal of organizing. If we talk about responsibility or the responsibility to, to lift people in, uh, above the dignity threshold and reduce the impact on the planetary boundaries to expand the safe and just operating zone for humanity. So the latter is sort of what I call the humanistic model and therefore dignity is central <laughs> and the planetary boundaries are, are sort of uh, the, the given. Um, <clears throat> you know, and you've read about the two stories, I think one is oriented towards thinking and doing that with the goal of having, the other one is thinking and doing with the goal of being. Uh, and then we have the whole narrative that's sort of oriented towards the psychopath, <clears throat> that's, that's oriented towards having, and that there's a new story. And you know about this new story with the four drives. Uh, and I just want to make sure that that is known well enough, because I think that's also critical for the categorization and then in the, uh, the understanding and upper, upper rationalization of dignity. Can you stay on the slide and explain what those dri those four drives are, Michael? Okay, great. Yeah, I will. And I have a neater video and all that kind of stuff produced also. <laughs> and so this is a this is a framework that's coming out of the evolutionary sciences. It's something that Paul Lawrence developed, who was at Harvard Business School. He passed away in 2011, but I was able to work with him for some time before that. And he had. <clears throat> Um, looked at motivation, I think coming out of this uh, 
if you look at the preface of his book, coming out of the frustration that uh, he saw, and he started, I think, his academic work in the 50s, 60s. <laughs> Um, and that was the, the rise of the human, human relations school and, and all of that, where Elton Mayo was in Harvard Business School and others. And so that was sort of a domain at the time. And uh, that was the water in which they were swimming. And that shifted in the 70s. And then Michael Denson and others would come. And the agency or principal agent theory took over as a framework of what human nature is. And, and he was frustrated with that and the impact of it. And so when evolutionary science made progress in terms of understanding who we are as human beings, especially with E.O. Wilson around and others, this was something that he had been working on. And so the basic presumption here is that yes, all humans, all life has a drive to acquire and a drive to defend, otherwise it would not be alive. So the drive to acquire is the DA, a moniker. The drive to defend is the DD. And you can see that in our brain structure, in the limbic structure, that's where fight and flight come in. And that's very, very rudimentary to us. And it's in our brain and it's the brain of many other living beings, in, including um, like amoebas and, and other sort of less developed structures, but life in general. Then uh, if you look at uh, a, a evolutionary perspective in, in a, the human species, you could say that uh, people of the Australopithecus type or Homo habilis type, they do mainly operate on the drive to acquire and the drive to defend. And they can and they could because they were protected. They were basically, as much as we know from anthropological accounts, they were living uh, by, uh, protected by trees. They were oftentimes actually living in trees. So they were able to live by themselves pretty much and, and feed themselves that way, survive that way. If, well, all the accounts say that that type of Homo species died out, a new species sort of evolved and actually took over for a long, long time. And that's Homo erectus and versions of, of Homo erectus. <clears throat> and uh, the reason people are arguing that that species emerged and survived is that they were able to bond. They were able to form tribes. They were able to collaborate. And that was not something, not a property of a prior species. And so 99 point some, something died out. That's, that's the current account. That may change, but the, the, the main, main point here is that our brain structure is inherited from that, uh, that Homo erectus type that then developed a massively larger brain that helped survival in groups. And a couple of other things help with that. First, the people are arguing fire. We were able now to basically cook food, store food, digest food more quickly. So uh, in all the types of um, uh, species that you know that can eat cooked food, there are not that many, but even if you look at that now, when you feed your dogs with uh, cooked food, etc., cetera, uh, they gain weight. <clears throat> they don't need to eat that much. They actually can use time to do other things. Uh, and ultimately their uh, intestines, they don't need to be as long. So the energy used uh, can move from digestion to other things. And in our species, it moved to brain development mostly. And so we have a much, much larger brain as a consequence and a much, much shorter uh, in, uh, digestive system. And what happened along with that is that the kind of neurons that would help us uh, that were developed were neurons that helped groups to develop better. So all of the emotional sort of set up on development of the brain, that's sort of shortcuts, heuristics for managing social relationships in tribes that would be helpful because uh, now that you had a shorter uh, digestive system, <laughs> you would need to, well, you could hunt together. The prey was big. Typically a tribe that could collaborate would outperform another tribe because you could eat food, you could hunt food better, you could store food better. And with fire around, you would need to guard fire, uh, especially if you wanted to keep it and you wouldn't want to wait for the next kind of uh, uh, 
thunderstorm to, to bring it. So you would have developed a system where people can sleep and others can guard and the fire was really something central. And that was easier done in tribes than in single uh, or other units. Another piece that happened is the, the families uh, were almost necessary because our brain grew so much that when our, our prior ancestors would give birth, <clears throat> Children couldn't operate immediately by themselves. So uh, typically what happened is that because the brain was so big, it, every sort of young uh, homo erectus needed gar uh, guarding and guiding and uh, that would make the nuclear family a superior model for any other model. And so bonding and being able to live in pairs was clearly an ad advantage in terms of survival there. So Paul Lawrence calls this whole apparat apparatus of Homo erectus the drive to bond. That's an independent drive that also is manifested in the brain structure. And then, of course, Homo erectus did not uh, make it, even though I think it's probably the longest la lasting species on earth. And then uh, it still died out. <coughs> again, massively 99 point something percent. And some remaining uh, uh, species members were able to develop further into homo, what we call now homo sapiens. And then other people would argue we're homo sapiens sapiens. And in, in other ways, what happened here is further brain development which you can see in many anthropological accounts is witnessed by a number of things, a further development of tools and the development of religions and symbolic systems. And these symbolic systems, they all root in the question, like when once you have that much brain power, <clears throat> you can uh, adapt to a world much more quickly, uh, to a world that is changing, to a climate that is changing, also to areas that are shifting in terms of uh, yeah, climate, and so our species can live in very hot and in very cold climates uh, and can adapt <clears throat> and use tools. And that was necessary uh, or impossible, impos arguably, because of our newly developed prefrontal cortex, another layer of our brain uh, that was analytical. <clears throat> and it's important to understand that our brain actually built on all of these prior um, uh, uh, developments. And so when we talk about reason, this is sort of something reason comes on top of emotion, comes on top of reflex and instinct in terms of drive to acquire, drive to defend and potentially bond. So the comprehension is basically the question, why is something happening this way that helps us develop tools that also makes us question uh, existentially, why are we here? And so that's why uh, many of these, well, actually all of our species have uh, have been seen to develop uh, religious systems, meaning systems, origin stories, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera, rituals. So this is the drive to comprehend, our, uh, according to um, Paul Lawrence, and that's something that makes us human. Uh, and these four drives, the drive to acquire, the drive to defend, the drive to bond, the drive to comprehend, those are operating all the time in our motivational substructure and they're independent of culture, they're proper to our species. And the real magic happens when you see that this is actually the objective and the ability of us to survive depends on us being able to balance those drives, not to maximize one or the other. In fact, when you maximize one or the other, you get into trouble. And you can see this with the drive to acquire when you get like whatever you would want, you don't, you have current situations with shareholder value, as I mentioned, <laughs> that gets us into trouble. If we maximize defense, we typically, yes, get a lot of guns, <laughs> like you can see in, in current culture and people basically are so afraid of each other that they, they stop living and then maybe start killing each other. <clears throat> The drive to bond, if it's maximized, is sort of giving rise to this traditional uh, tribalism, nationalism, in-group versus out-group dominations. And you can just look at history that typically is at the root of many of the of wars, many of the war stories and uh, annihilation and, and, and yeah, genocide in many ways at its extreme. The drive to comprehend provides, if maximized, uh, space for ideologues. And then of course, combined together, all of that can, can wreak havoc if it's out of balance.
Uh, and so the, the, the thing that I think is interesting to me here is that this provides a better picture of why we are <clears throat> in trouble because we're basically missing out on the drive to bond and the drive to comprehend. And you can see that on an individual level. Uh, you can see this at <clears throat> the team level and all the studies that have been done. And I think the Google study of Aristotle, et cetera. Do, do, you, do you recall that? There's this famous Aristotle study looking at the highest performing teams in Google. Well, so basically what they find is that, yes, it depends on psychological safety, it depends on trust, it depends on a higher purpose, and then those teams can really outperform others. So in other words, this is basically just the four drives <laughs> in balance. Uh, and you can see this at a societal level as well, at an organizational level as well, and the whole quest for CSR is in many ways both the restoration of trust, the drive to bond, and the drive to comprehend a higher purpose, and oftentimes though, it's used to maximize the drive to acquire and therefore people become cynical and therefore people are thinking like, you know what, this is really not workable for me. Uh, and then you have organizations like B Corps, the Economy for the Common Good and others that actually intuitively try to balance these things uh, and therefore they become more attractive. Now, there is a, a danger in social enterprise and others that they're focusing so much on the drive to comprehend and the drive to bond and all of these satisfactions that they're missing out the drive to defend and the drive to acquire and then they also have burnout in many ways and that's a big big problem with, with social entrepreneurs change makers and all these people that are sort of the heroes that I mentioned in the very beginning. This is interesting also because it actually connects with a lot of prior insights about human nature coming from philosophy, coming from the natural sciences, coming from Darwin uh, in many ways, which I think is mostly puzzling to people that don't know much about Darwin. And Darwin actually never said it's about competition only. He's like very clear that collaboration is a clear advantage for many, for many species uh, and even morality. Uh, once he's, he's, he argues, once we have developed that kind of brain capacity and it, many other species that would develop that level of brain capacity, morality is just a, a smart survival mechanism. And what happens, of course, with morality, it's, it's oftentimes understood as this universalist morality uh, and it's mostly group morality. So it works for group level. And that's how it works. And this is, I think, very critical to understand that most of the time, even in organizations, we don't use it. Uh, we think of us as amoral, and that's where many people disengage in, in terms of yeah, seeing it as a violation of our fundamental morality. And the question of what is right and what is good is actually truly fund foundational to who we are as human beings. And we're sort of currently uh, not not engaging with that, but philosophy and theology and all of these other insights of the humanities and the social sciences would point to that as critical. So this is where I think the consilience of knowledge that E.O. Wilson talks about, and actually I was just talking to a number of Catholic scholars, they have this concept of the unity of knowledge <clears throat> that all comes together and overlaps. So there is no distinction necessarily in terms of the various uh, the traditions of knowledge, whether they're the humanities, the natural sciences, or the social sciences, they could draw on the same kind of insight about human nature. Yet in social sciences, we oftentimes adopt the same one as we have in economics. And that's really, I think, that's part of the bigger problem uh, that we're facing, that many of the, of the other sciences, even what we draw on from the natural sciences is really, really a poor representation of who we are as human beings. So this is where the concept of dignity comes in which I think can help us to understand how we can see us as fully human. And the four drives in balance could be uh, a, seen as, as something foundational to who we are as human beings, as valuable, intrinsically valuable. Now the economistic perspective here I put up, Michael Jensen says that doesn't even matter. Like, like it or not, individuals are willing to sacrifice a little of almost anything we care to name, even reputation, 
or morality for a sufficiently large quantity of other desired things. And these things do not have to be money or even material goods. So he acknowledges that there are potentially the existence of other motivational factors. Yet he says, we're always trading them off. There is no minimum threshold. And uh, therefore there is no such thing as dignity. There is no intrinsic value. It's all just extrinsic and we can exchange it. And therefore we create human capital, natural capital, cultural capital, all the kinds of capitals to just trade them. Um, the humanistic perspective draws on the, the Kantian term, or you can also call it a, a theological term in terms of we're made in the image of God. Every, every human being is in, made in the image of God or, or a version of that. Kant doesn't use God. He just says that uh, every, every, that there are categories, that there is something that can be replaced by something else, then it has a price. And whatever is above all price and uh, therefore does not have an equivalent has dignity. So dignity is much more a general category according to this. So anything that is priceless, yet it's oftentimes connected with life. Life is priceless. And what is life? Human life may be this respect or this, this, these four drives in balance because every time when they are imbalanced, then uh, life stops. Can I ask so, a question mm -hmm, on the mm -hmm. Kantian one? just to make sure I understand it, the, the idea is that dignity can't be traded, can't be replaced. It could be given away, but it's not, you, it's, there is no equivalent to it, right? You, it's like if well, you're trading money for milk, that's a, a trade, but right. if you give away the dignity, there is no equivalent for it to trade. Well, you can violate it, but you cannot trade it. Okay. You, cannot, you cannot even give it away, right? You can just massively accept a violation of it, um, but you have it. That's the idea. You okay. have it, and, and that's it. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's something that, uh, that is more universally understood, intuitively especially, and that's why advertisers, I think this is still the, one of the most successful campaigns. I don't know if you remember this uh, ad campaign, but it's still around in New York City in, in different other versions. And I think it was one of the first internet net memes that came around was just uh, mock-ups of this, this campaign. There's something money cannot buy. For everything else, there is this credit card. And uh, it speaks to people. They know that there is something that is priceless. And then for everything else, that there is, uh, there is a, a trading mechanism or a payment mechanism. Tyson, did you want to come in? I did. Um, I just wonder, uh, not that the conceptual clarity of um, using the word dignity is, is, is lacking, but how, like if we lost that word, how else would we describe it? Kant was probably not writing in English anyway. Is there, does that spread out any, would we, would we draw on a cloud of terms that are facets of dignity? Um, well, there, in, in the papers, of course, there, I mean, we've, we've massive papers and special issues on the term of dignity and the conceptualization, and there are a number of volumes. And I think that's, um, that still needs to be fleshed out more. I do think that dignity understood as intrinsic value is enough to shift a lot in, in, in terms of our understanding, because we, unfortunately, I feel we do, for measurement reasons and for all the mechanics of science, we need to focus on something that we can measure and that's easily mm -hmm. done with price or price mm -hmm. equivalence. And that's the whole conversation about natural capital, cu cultural capital, all of the capitals, they are denominators for something that we can trade. Uh, and if you looked at it differently and you said, you know what, maybe nature is intrinsically valuable and we don't wanna trade it then we need to find different mechanisms of valuing it. And that shifts the whole organizational ambition of, of having the intelligence of, of the world in one person, like being fully, fully informed homo economicus that can make a rational decision, just maybe, maybe be an algorithm. And it requires going back to the foundational social nature that we have and a shared distributed knowledge. And then you have different governance systems, you have different decision-making systems, you have different ways of, of honoring that dignity. But I think it's just that literacy and an awareness of the possibility that there are things that are intrinsically valuable. And, and right now we're relegated to a vocabulary of where something is only valuable if it has a price or can be exchanged or does have some kind of a number on it. Hmm. Um, and one more follow-up just would be um, do our colleagues in anthropology have 
good words or good concepts for society without exchange? Because it sounds like that's another, we could talk about homo economicus as mm -hmm. like the thing we're against, but we could also talk about distilling everything down to exchange and saying uh, that's yeah. also wrong. So what are the alternatives? Right, excellent, excellent. So a paper that I'm working on is based on a framework by Alan Fiske, uh, F-I-S-K-E. So he's an anthropologist and uh, he has developed those four grammars of social relations. And one of them is uh, the pricing mechanism. And that's sort of the most recent in our development. Before that, you have communal sharing. That's the original one. That's where the Homo erectus and the tribal piece comes in. And then you have equality matching, sort of like exchange, but without price. And then you have, oh, sorry, sorry, that was the third one. The, the fourth, the first, the second one is authority ranking. That you have an authority decide what's good for you so that we moved away from the tribe towards in a hierarchical system in a way of a relationship um, that's also reinforced by moving towards homo erectus style parental structures where you have authority it helps organize the tribe if you have these authority ranking structures now they are in 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 many ways they're combinable he says they're they're different combinations of it and if you want to sort of think about this is, has nothing to do with dignity necessarily and it has something to do with how we organize and that there are different properties of this organ of these organizational modes and my my work in terms of what i'm hoping to do is figure out what it would mean if dignity was connected to these four archetypal uh, organizational modes and you can see that that yes you have fair trade for example in the pricing mechanism so there is a dignity component in the pricing mechanism you have authority ranking structures with legitimacy and that's where you respect certain dignity you have the opposite of it too the communal structures you you basically could see as something where you respect each other as a human being foundationally intrinsically valuable uh, but you can also see that as in, in communal structures that there's an absence of that. Um, and so I don't know if that gets to the question that you're asking, but that's sort of what, what I respond to when you're saying other, other terms. Definitely. No, thank you. I mean, I, your paper is going to be great. Um, and, and I think it's, it's when we identify these, um, I've heard the term root metaphor, it seems appropriate here. A root metaphor of exchange um, that we that we're questioning these and so trying to identify many of those that humanistic management questions uh, rather than just one at a time is uh, i think helpful so i now have two right one is well the other one is utility is, yeah the other one okay. is utility yeah. i think utility is the one where people are saying dignity challenges utility so the utilitarian framework of something has a price utility is, is, is actually a broader term than price, of course. But utility as that which is of use to you at this point. Right? And, and that is where the original economic Anglo-Saxon um, logic that was developed that underpins uh, traditional modern economics. And so that's where I think some other yeah, term uh, can be explored more. That I think actually would be a very critical one that I haven't thought much about. But that George, um, some some person uh, I don't forget the, the first name, but Waldron is his, his last name, has written about this. I believe suggesting that dignity is is an alternative foundational concept, yeah. replacing potentially replacing uh, utility. Hmm. And can I can I just jump in? Uh, one of the first interviews we did on the humanistic professionals was with Donna uh, Hicks and she was talking to us about dignity and she she explained the difference between respect and dignity and I think in terms of alternate words people use respect a lot when what they really mean is dignity and in my own work as I switched out of using respect and moving into using dignity which is what I really meant all along um, it I find that it's really powerful people understand the word in a way that they don't understand respect and that it changes the whole dynamic in conversation. So um, I don't 
I, I really think we should be pushing on the word dignity and not looking for alternatives for all the reason Michael explained, but also because of how it impacts the people we're talking to and how we're trying to educate people. It really, it really works. So I don't, I, the alternatives that people use to try and approximate dignity don't work in the same way as the word dignity does. Can I just jump in there? I, I would, I mean, that is part of an article I wrote about like what is dignity? Because I think one of the challenges is exactly that it is such a broad term. So I, I would argue we need some more granularity of what we mean by dignity. And for example, if you do, look at dignity at work literature, that is actually there's dignity, dignity at work, dignity in work, which has to do with fair pay, with respect, with um, being able to be unionized, things like that. So there's different levels of dignity. So as much as I think it's a powerful word as such, I think we need to be careful, especially if what you said earlier, Tyson, if we're thinking of how do you measure that, then you probably need to have a bit of more granular understanding what exactly we're talking about because it's very difficult to accuse of let's say, let's say an, a management team of not respecting dignity if that might mean different things for different people so i think there's there's two sides to it yes it's a powerful concept as such and people understand but it's also very easy to misunderstand even either deliberately or just different people understand dignity differently so I think it's it's one of my bugbears that like dignity is broadly used in UN um, decent work um, decent work pamphlets, but it's actually not explained what we actually mean by it. Well, isn't so, that so, the challenge <laughs> of what we what we're doing with this organization? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, exactly. And, 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 and my short version of this would be a balance of the four drives. That's what dignity is if you want to operationalize it. And uh, that can be measured that we are measuring that we see the impact of it. And, and for, for the presentation here right now, I actually, I, I agree with you, Anke. Uh, yes, and there's lots of work on, on dignity at work and, and in work and, and all these things. Oftentimes what it comes down to, though, is a very limited impact. And then it goes and moves into possibly human rights. Then the other piece is uh, anti-bullying uh, and, and, and care work, etc., something like that. So it's rather limited in, in its power. I think it's actually under limit. It's, it's underutilized in many ways and put in a box where I think it, it doesn't help much. And Agreed. that's, yeah, Agreed. and so that's why I, I think I want to take it out of there for now as a general concept at a really high level. And then yes, you can bring it back down to various contexts. And I do think that the power comes from being decontextualized as a, as a concept as much as, as utility is um, because it's so foundational. So both and. Right, right, right. <clears throat> but, but for now, for in this in this presentation for the categorization, I really aim on the on the on the utility level. Okay. Right. Um, so you're moving into the typologies and, and right, like right, 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 right. So I mean, and there are of course different versions of of dignity, and and one is uh, where it's unconditional. Okay, and then the other one is conditional. And that's where dignity and work comes in and other pieces. Yes, this is conditional dignity. There are practices that can recognize and, and potentially promote dignity. They can violate dignity. And the other part is the, the human rights-based dignity where this is just, this. everybody has it, we need to protect it. Uh, and therefore all the practices that, that honor that, that's, that's sort of a separate bucket almost. Um, and, uh, in, in the way of the categorization, when you take this dignity notion seriously or more seriously and both of those seriously, then, then you have to switch almost the objective function of what you're organizing for. Uh, it could be seen as dignity promotion as the objective function and that didn't seem to be too clear what that actually means. And I think that dignity, that's where the limit of dignity is. It is not an outcome. <laughs> It is sort of the, the antecedents or the input or the, the, pre, the, the condition. Uh, and the outcome actually is when people live a dignified life or when life is lived with dignity, there is a certain sense of well-being, a higher sense of well-being. Jürgen, that's the potentially Bhutan style of well-being, 
where you don't need to have much because you have a balance of those four drives, you're actually quite content and happy. So if, if you use that, you can see the economistic versus the humanistic perspective still sort of basically operate on the same foundational understanding of human nature. The only difference is that the objective function of the economistic model is wealth, power, and status, and that the drive to acquire is the one that dominates. And if you're very smart and you're using Michael Jensen's enlightened way of looking at human beings in, in principal agency, then you have the bonding drive, the comprehension drive, the drive to defend, all included, yet they're only there to serve uh, the drive to acquire. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, I need to move. Um, and the, the, the humanistic categorization then would be more, okay, there's a dignity threshold. That's also what uh, I think now, um, I mean, that's basically where human rights comes in, the dignity threshold. That's a basic right. <clears throat> that's an operationalization on the societal level. Um, there are other operationalizations in the context of work. Yet, uh, I think this is also where, uh, uh, um, what's in, I forget the names of um, the, the uh, business ethicist and right, a famous paper, 2015, um, uh, sort of talks about the dignity threshold. And, and I feel to um, Jim, Jim Walsh, Jim Walsh and someone else, they talk about this dignity threshold as well. So if you then move beyond that, then you, yeah, you can represent it like this, but here, here is basically the categorization. There's the neglect of dignity, there's the protection of dignity, the promotion of dignity at, at one level, and then there are the different objective function, uh, the wealth creation function and the well-being creation <laughs> objective function. And what we have created then is sort of the, the ways of looking at what, how we organize when we neglect dignity and create wealth. This is what I term economism. This is where it's basically just market. Market and price. And everything has to be capital and everything needs to be traded if we wanna uh, organize and the objective is wealth creation. Then uh, in terms of protection of dignity, that's where human rights comes in. That's maybe where some of the, the boundary conditions are introduced and said, okay, well, there's something that we need to respect. So while we are agreeing, we want to have wealth creation at the firm level, at the societal level, uh, there needs to be a basic conduct that we need to agree to. This could be the uh, United Nations uh, principles uh, for, uh, what is it, the, the uh, global compact principles as boundary conditions, it could be CSR codes, this could be all kinds of other codes that have been introduced. Basically, they still just, they are trying to bound the wealth creation objective in terms of the sandwich function of what we want to maximize. It's sort of saying, yes, maximize, but just Calm, calm down a little bit on this end or on that end and, and uh, bound your activities a little bit. Now, uh, there's a third version that Millet calls uh, masked economism or others call enlightened economism. I think this is where conscious capitalism could fall in, is where the promotion of dignity, we advance the human condition, but the objective function is wealth. And we have basically decided and accepted that wealth creation is really what we want. And therefore, uh, the promotion of a dignified state of life is in service to wealth creation. And I do believe that much of the current conversation in organizing is stuck there, if at all. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and in many ways, it doesn't switch to what I think is more of the, where the humanistic um, organizing uh, happens. And uh, the, if you switch the objective function to well-being or some form of um, welfare uh, understood as, as more than just wealth, then uh, when you neglect dignity, you have the other kind of uh, difficult situation that is also part of our legacy, this paternalist administrative structures, where basically the iron cage rules, dignity doesn't matter, humans don't matter, but what matters is, or justification is, that uh, social welfare is created or well-being is created without respect 
um, for dignity. This has been actually in our history much of what, what we consider progress. <laughs> So uh, moving from the feudalist societies towards a much more legalistic society was a paternalist uh, triumph. And there was the, the notion of dignity behind it. And in the end, what we created oftentimes with the administrative structures here is, is oftentimes what people hate uh, because there is no space for, for dignity either. I call it paternalism, but you could call it administrative as well. And then if you switch and you, you have this bounded humanism, you will see that yes, of course, well-being creation needs to happen with respect for dignity. There's a bounded uh, a minimum level. And then if you move to promoting uh, dignity, then you have what I would call humanistic forms of organizing. That's where social enterprises operate. That's where uh, some of the economy for the common good operate. Uh, that's where I think many of the, uh, of the attempts are going. Um, and there are sort of very few examples, though there are a couple here that I want to mention that are more in that space. Um, and you can see that basically in many ways, they are also not stating their goal, their objective function to be wealth or shareholder value or anything else. It's, it's a function of uh, well-being creation wherever they operate. So that's the, the, the categorization that comes out of the, the term of dignity, the conditional and the unconditional, and the switch of the objective function there. Sorry, Michael, the, the logos, are all of those bottom right um, cell? Is that the um, kind of idea? E, somewhat, but I mean, that's where also the, of course, the, the typology is so helpful as an archetype. And then when you go into it, it's, <clears throat> it, it isn't at that, that level that granular. Okay. There, there are errors. certain activities. Yeah, they're, they're, they're sort of like types, right? And they would fit mm -hmm. more in there than in, in, in the other space. Great. Wait, so I'm, I'm sorry if I could just, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused because I was understanding the bottom right, uh, uh, square um we're still you described that as still the objective is wealth creation and so in this square that we're or the the framework that we're seeing on the screen right now the the well-being creation organizations would don't appear or if if you have if your objective is well-being creation that's not necessarily represented in this framework up on the screen right now. Is that correct? No, no, I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, if I misspoke, but in, in the bottom right, the humanism term mm -hmm. uh, categorization, that's where the objective function is well-being creation or some form of it. People typically, they're moving more into that language of well-being um, or, or for benefit or whatever, but uh, that's where wealth is, is a means to a higher end, a higher purpose. And so that is actually, yeah, there are many more organizations now moving into that space. Okay, can, can you go back to the logo page? Because the, the reason that, that I'm, uh, and maybe, maybe this is just sort of poking around at that granular level. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have, you've got the B Corp logo there and, and, I guess I, I was just sort of questioning. Uh, there are many B Corps who that I think have a wealth creation objective, not a well being creation objective. And the, or they're trying to balance the two. And I, and I guess I was trying to, to figure out if you're saying that most of, most of these organizations and firms on this page would fall into that bottom right uh, uh, quadrant. Um, I guess I'm, I'm just. Yeah, I, I, so don't hold me, <laughs> uh, hold my feet to the fire on, on all of these and forever, because some of these organizations have started out that way. Many of them are actually cooperative in structure. Some of them have moved out of that. Some have moved into that. But John Lewis Partnership, for example, clearly states they're oriented towards well-being of their employees. <laughs> that's one of the objectives that's not oriented towards wealth creation. Of course, they're highly profitable. 
uh, so is Migros, so is Mondragon, and all of these other uh, companies. Yeah. Um, and I do think that, and then maybe Anke, you are more of an expert there, that uh, the B corporations, if, if you get certified, you cannot get certified with the ambition or your overall purpose to be shareholder value or, or some kind of... You need, well, you, do you need to change your um, company objectives? So, right. so it's, legal, it's a legal, um, legal change you need to make. The purpose of your company needs to be defined differently than stakeholder value. That's correct. Shareholder value, right. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm, value. And maybe, maybe this is just... I, I'm probably getting, getting into the weeds Far more than we need to right now. I was I was thinking, for example, some of the more prominent B corporations mm -hmm. like Ben and Jerry's. Um, you know, Unilever owns Ben and Jerry's, and therefore, uh, Unilever itself is. You know, they are about wealth creation, and so I guess it, it, this is a. It's actually that's actually shifting, and and uh, so this is actually interesting to see that many of the companies. When they started out, they are starting out somewhere in the humanist uh, domain, if you use that lens, mm -hmm. because they have to. <laughs> and, and uh, for example, Unilever specifically started out with hygiene. Um, and that was something that was clearly oriented towards better health and well-being. And that's where the soap came in. And then from that on, they, 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 come, they put things together with margarine and all kind of stuff. So that was also oriented towards uh, well-being. Um, and they lost their way. And then with uh, the Paul Pullman's uh, uh, um, at the helm, they shifted back out. They have a whole, I think their goal is the creation of well-being now. And they're also becoming, or they intend to become a B Corp. And so I think at that level, putting a company in there is, is sometimes hard. What I want to mention with this framework, this is if you if you step out of the, the organizational level, this is something that can guide research, practice, pedagogy, and policy or conversations in a way it's like, okay, where are we right now and where do we ultimately want to end up? And if you see this model, this is where we still are stuck in the in the sandwich thing. Right. Uh, the maximization and we're not necessarily moving to the 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 um, the bagel or do donut style of organizing yet with the sdgs that's all shifting in some way right the objective function has shifted there that's what the oecd is trying to work on that we're measuring well-being that's where bhutan is is leading <laughs> <laughs> that's where where many of the organiz uh, organizational structures at the national level are but also we have lots of organizations that have always been that way cooperatives by the way and, and other structures have focused on uh, well be well being creation, and so then the question is much more: How do we do research on them? How do we do practice? Uh, how do we inform practice? What is the pedagogy that we're using to help understand these organizational mechanisms? What's the policy to support this? So at that level, I would see this is helpful. If you go into a company and analyze a company in its practices, it may be less helpful. Mm -hmm. Something we might try playing around with sometime, Michael, if you're interested, would be to, to put the four drives on the rows of this table, because wealth would be drive to acquire, mm -hmm. and talk about the, you know, the perversion or the reduction. The left-hand side would be the reduction of that drive onto, mm -hmm. onto something. And then um, I think one of the things I'm reacting to is wealth is a component of well-being. Right. Right. Aristotle even says a certain amount of, of resources is necessary for sustaining. So then you could say the promotion of dignity um, for each of the four drives synthesized together, that's well-being, right? Well-being almost becomes the right-hand column if we look at the different reductionist approaches. Not that this is wrong, but that could be a different way of, of um, trying to explain it. Yeah, and I was gonna. I was going in the same place Tyson was. To me, um, you know, it's it's about balance. So well-being creation and wealth creation in balance. The protecting of dignity and the promotion of dignity occur together. It's not either or, right? You're doing both, and it's so. To me, that whole the 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 right for you know the right side of this. You know, we we want to avoid the neglection of dignity in both areas but we want to do 
all of the stuff on the right. We want to protect dignity. We want to promote dignity. We want um, wealth creation and we want well-being creation. It's the balance that you were talking about, but we should probably move on because we've got, um, you know, only 10 minutes left, right? So. Can I well, just ask a question? Is it only me? I don't know what is bounded humanism. What one sentence, what that is. That's basically uh, uh, bounded humanism. That's, that's uh, so um, as an example, that's a, a good one. That's sort of like, um, uh, finance, uh, microfinance is a bounded humanism in a sense that yes, okay, well, we want to accept or uh, say that everyone has access to credit, right? And and Yunus was talking about that as a human right. So okay, credit is the the the, the foundation of it. Now, whatever people do with that, we don't really care so much. But there is this this access to finance, which is uh, seen as an element of well-being creation. And uh, in that sense, this, this is not yet fully fleshed out in a way that humanism would be where it's also focused on the promotion of dignity, where educational ventures come in, where other uh, pieces come into being. And Yunus himself started with the microfinance, but then created all these other kind of ventures that are much more in the promotion of dignity space, right? So, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. much clearer. Thank and in the, in the book, I actually showcase how all of these um, areas, research, practice, pedagogy, and policy could be reshaped walking through these, these um, um, categorizations. Thank you. Maybe, Michael, if you allow me just a, a quick comment. Um, I, I, I see this discussion is, to me, kind of about values, right? What do we value? Is it wealth or is it well-being? Um, what's a little bit funny to me is even the box well-being creation because creation is, is an active word, right? It's about doing something. And the beauty of the word well-being is it's, it's not about doing, it's about being. Um, so by well-being creation, it's kind of a, to me, almost a contradicting double remy. Um, but... Mm, that's just a side note. I mean, the great thing is really um, that well-being is um, is really increasing in, in global momentum. You might have seen um, the newest uh, Joseph Stiglitz um, article um, where he talks that uh, talks about that there's a global well-being movement. Um, so that's uh, really great to see because Bhutan might have started this decades ago. But what use, it, what use is it if the rest of the world doesn't get it? So it's really heartening to see that uh, OECD, Iceland, Scotland, New Zealand, etc., are jumping on this well-being um, paradigm. In, to me, um, at least from a Bhutan perspective, well-being is, is, is holistic. I mean, they call it cross-national happiness, but they mean holistic well-being. And to me, therefore, true well-being has to uh, protect and promote dignity. I mean, I don't think there can be well-being, uh, including environment, by the way, right? This is why Bhutan is climate, uh, climate neutral. Um, so I think this whole uh, discussion is, is very timely in gaining increasing uh, interest. Over. We only have a couple minutes left, Michael. So um, I don't, I, I don't think we got into the typologies that we were supposed to at some point need to talk about. So I don't know if that's what we want to do next time. Wait, wait, this is the typology. Oh, this is the typology. This okay. is the, the type. These are the archetypes. All this right. is uh, and and uh, this is the foundation of it. And I do think yes, there there is a lot more to be said in terms of like the how they are helpful possibly in terms of informing the conversation uh, and i do think jürgen what you're mentioning that that, that well-being is now part of a conversation only happens because we had a prior focus almost exclusively focused on on on, um, on wealth creation and gdp gdp is is uh, that for the national level it's um shareholder value for the organizational level it's income at the individual level and now people are starting to talk at all levels about something else, including the business round table and all this happening. So you see, you could see and view the world as a shift going back from 
the uh, very market-based neglecting dignity economism model to potentially a humanist model. And I do think that there is this danger uh, that people are potentially then going to be trapped in a paternalistic model where they don't don't see dignity happening. That's what you see in many other countries. That's where nationalism comes in back again. That's where many of those other uh, uh, organizing modes uh, potentially come back in with a promise of well-being, uh, a neglect of dignity is kicking in, in in many ways. So that's just where I think that's, that's helpful. Um, in the book, I go into more detail of how you can restructure pretty much research practice, pedagogy and policy along those lines. Um, and and for, for today, I just wanted to basically lay out these, these types as, as general categories. Great. So I'm going to close this out for the people that are watching this on the web. Uh, this has been the International Humanistic Management Association's Fellows Conversation. Um, if you want to learn more about what we do, come to our website, humanisticmanagement.international, and join up. The website is going to include this as a post with links to the books uh, that Michael referenced and other things. Thank you so much.